It's the Score North Twin Show. Yeah, we were off balance the whole game. Um, uh, Yarborough, we, you know, he's been around for a little while now. Everyone's pretty familiar with what he does, but uh, it, it seemed like um, you could tell early that um, his mix of different shapes and different speeds was. Uh, was tough and you know you're hoping as the game goes on that you adjust to it and that you can slow some things down or or you know get on top of some pitches we just weren't able to do it I mean I just looked he threw 78 pitches in seven innings so um the he was throwing strikes and uh you know we just we weren't able to get it going Welcome into the Score North Twin Show, where we just want the Twins to win a playoff game for the first time in almost 20 years. Not lose to one of the worst teams in Major League Baseball's 162-game schedule history three times in the same weekend. But we will attempt to unpack it here, because that's what we do. We are a show of the people. If you are in need of Twins therapy, it is our job, damn it, to provide that to you today with our State of the Twins discussion. How are you guys feeling after uh, that weekend of Twins baseball? Disgusted. That was despicable. That was gross. There is no spinning it. Um, you, you know what got me today? Two of the stories I read off that game were, were about the impending trade deadline and how if the Twins can just get some right-handed hitting to combat their problems against left-handed pitching, they got swept by the Royals. I am absolute. Well, I actually, you know what? I'd like to thank them. I'd like to thank them because I now have complete clarity by what I would do by five o'clock tomorrow. So I well, will thank them for that. And that okay, that and that's going to be a good segue uh, into the first category, which we'll get to on our State of the Twins Monday, where we we lay out some different categories. We will play an immaculate grid challenge because that might be the most fun thing here. We have to do the not fun thing, which is bury this team, which is actually kind of fun sometimes. But um, yeah, this State of the Twins show is presented by our friends at Modest, one of the great, great breweries, downtown Minneapolis, a tap room in the North Loop, uh, North Loop easy for me to say, right next to Target Field. Uh, if you're not sipping on a Supra Deluxe Premium Lager during these summer months, man, you are missing out. Or the Supra Deluxe Sea Salt Lime. Oh, uh, yeah. My local liquor store has like eight or nine different types of modest available too. So they're all over the place. Uh, they opened in 2016. The first live podcast we ever did as the Scorner Twin Show back in 2019, the summer of Bomba Soda, was at Modest actually with Glenn Perkins and our guy Rami Wetmore. It was a good time. So check them out, modestbrewing.com, modestbrewing.com. All right, boys, here's the overall snapshot. It's not pretty. The Twins have lost five games in a row. They're now down to 54 and 53, just a half game ahead of the Guardians. The Twins offense is 19th in run score per game. The Twins run prevention, pitching and defense is fourth in runs allowed per game. They were first and second largely throughout, you know, the last couple months. Baseball reference has gone from an 84% chance to make the playoffs to a 67% chance, 2% to win it all. Fangraphs has them 67% chance to make the playoffs as well, 3% to win it all. But the magic number is down to 56 games. Let's get it. Yes. We're gonna win twins. We're gonna <laughs> score. We're gonna oh. win. So my first category for you guys is now what? They got they got swept by the Royals. The Royals were on pace to flirt with or maybe set, along with the A's, by the way, who are slightly worse uh they, they, they were flirting with the 162 game mlb record for losses in a season heading into the weekend and then they went and collected 10 percent of their victories on the season against the twins this weekend that's right <laughs> the royals collected 10 percent of their wins on the season against the twins this weekend yeah so what do you do the, the trade deadline is tomorrow what now i guess is the question Oh, I'm, first of all, I'm bailing. I'm, I'm done here. Um, d during the telecast, or I'm sorry, during the broadcast on Friday or Saturday, I think it was Saturday, Provis started to go through um, 
some of the numbers since the All-Star break. And by the way, the Twins came back from the break and played well. But the pitching is declining. The pitching, and, and just during the course, small sample size, I realize, of this five-game skid, the Twins have uh, given up nine, eight, eight, ten, and then two runs. They've been outscored 37 to 27 in that time. And we talked about this. The starting pitching and the pitching in general was likely to regress. The offense had to do more. But unfortunately, it's not doing enough now. So by 5 o'clock tomorrow, if I can move him, and there's a chance I just can't, I'm trading Kepler. By 5 o'clock tomorrow, I'm going to trade at least one of the pitchers who's going to walk on me after the season. I think Sonny Gray gets you the most. Maeda who also is going to be a free agent, actually has bounced back nice as well. But I'm trading at least one of those. I'm calling up, if nothing else, I'm calling up Varlin, Keuchel potentially. I'm plugging them in, and I am saying, you know what? If you guys can win the division, that's absolutely fine. But you just you just crapped all over yourself against, as Phil said, historically bad team. And as Phil knows from covering the sport, deadline deals are made in part to offer – Emphasis of, you guys have done great. Now here's a little seasoning or a big piece of seasoning. Like, here's something to make you better. When the team embarrasses you, and look, Falvey and Baldelli are to blame too. But my point is, this team has done nothing but for the most part be a dead-ass team for a good portion of this season to deserve any type of reward. And I'm going to try to get anything I can for a guy like Gray, who I know is not coming back, no matter what I do. And let me just end this rant with this assessment of, because I, you know, well, but what happens when guys come around? What happens? Okay, tomorrow is August 1st, folks. What happens is if they come around, it's probably called April of 24. But let me give you some Carlos Correa, okay? So in the first eight games back, leading off, Looking better. First eight games back from the All-Star break. He slashes 294, 385 on base, 500 slugging, homer, 5 RBIs, 10 10 hits in 34 at-bats. Okay, starting to turn things around, right? In the six games before Sunday, in which he went one for four with a strikeout again, he is back to slashing 185, 258, 259, and has driven in two runs, five for 27. Yeah. It ain't happening. I'm done. What's wrong with him? Dude, I have no idea. I have no clue. I don't know if if the plantar fasciitis continues to, to be a problem, in which case he probably should have spent, if that's the case, I'm just speculating here, he probably should have spent a little bit of time on the IL. He clearly didn't want to, but I don't know. You know, I mean, who knows? It could be a mental thing. You know, the Mets and Giants said, here's all this money. Ah, hold on a second. Now it's not there. Well, that was but, ankle, right? I mean, is it, is it his ankle? No, no. But I'm saying, could could it be mental? Because, you know, he thought he was oh. going to those two teams. And then God, as much as we spun it up, he likes it. He really likes us. He you know, no, he, so bad. He yeah. came back here because he had no other options. I'm, I don't know what's wrong. And at this point, I don't care. He ain't coming around. Um, Buxton's started to hit a bit now. But guess what? He's also been up and down, roller coaster. I'm done. I am done. And I will not I will not back off of this if they beat a crappy team again. You just got swept by an awful team, and you gave up in that time eight, ten, and two runs, and you couldn't find a way to win any of those games. The Royals on Saturday took that big lead, I think it was six rip, and begged you to come back and beat them. Like they were giving that game away. They're like, oh, you take this, you take this. And they give up 10 runs. I I am done with this collection. If you win the division, that's fine. The division's a complete joke. If Cleveland does, that's fine too. But this is just a complete embarrassment of baseball. And yes, you're in a bad division. But there is nothing about this team to scream. They've got the juice to do it. Nothing. That was great. That was great, Rant. I'm going to give it up for that. That was good. Thank you. All right, Dex, well, well, how would you sort of handle this now after that sweep with a day and a half before the trade deadline? Uh, it's it's a sour taste, and I'm trying to away two things. Judd's big thing, which I always kind of find it's hard to believe, not hard to believe, but hard to quantify, is don't embarrass yourself. 
but I feel like this team has embarrassed wow. Judd so much that no matter how they lose, they're embarrassing themselves. Now, I will say losing to the Kansas City Royals, who had only like, yeah, 27 wins going into the weekend, is it's pretty lowly. But it's also three games in a 162-game season. You, you, got, you got swept by a really bad team. You're still in first place. You can still find something to add at the deadline without giving up a ton. Um, I'm, I'm not completely out on this team because they lost three games to a really bad baseball team. That's just going to happen over the course of the season. I mean, uh, it, that hasn't, being, it hasn't happened to anyone else yet this season. Yeah, but it's like, all right, if they go to October and win a playoff game, are you guys going to come back to July 28th, 29th, and 30th and say, remember, they got swept by the Royals? Well, no, but that's not, well, let me, okay, let me, because I, so you guys are on sort of opposite sides here of what this weekend meant to you. I am closer to Judd after watching those three games in this regard. It's not about like they win a playoff game and you like go back and bitch about Kansas City. It's about what did that Kansas City series do to your strategy going into tomorrow before five o'clock central time. Yeah. And so my whole thought on this, like, yeah, add you're in win now mode. You might as well keep going. You've been trying to win. You added Correa, you know, you've, you're, you're doing all this stuff to win right now. You should absolutely try to trade for pieces to win right now. My thought was they'd be five, six plus games clear of Cleveland for first place by the time the trade deadline. And it looked like they were doing so well, right? Like, Oh, come out of the all-star break. And uh, are going to be the hottest team in baseball. They won like eight out of ten games. The offense starts to click, and oh, we're all right. Here we go. Four games up on the Guardians, and then they absolutely crap themselves in Kansas City. And so now it's like, okay, you're a half game up. You can barely stay above five hundred. You just got swept by the Royals. We'll get to the pitching stuff. The division is still in question. Like the division should not be in question. If I'm going to, if I'm, first of all, I am not trading Brooks Lee anymore. Like that, I don't think any of us were pushing for that, but it was like, boy, if there's a deal out there that makes sense and you can leverage your top prospect, well, we're open minded to it. I would not be trading top young assets to try and keep my head above 500. I think there's a huge difference between like being seven games over 500 and having a five or six game lead while you make your trade deadline decision versus struggling to you know gasp for air and now are you you know now it's like are you adding pieces to something that's just train wrecking like it did last year anyway so my, so this weekend actually did change my strategy on what I would do in the next 36 hours absolutely and here so here's the thing too that continues to be a problem with this, and I think it's fair to call them consistently dead ass team. Okay, Dex, you're right. If it was three games, like if they had put together a very respectable year and they lose three games to a god awful team, that's embarrassing. It sucks, but it's three games. But the 2023 Twins are the prospective employee who comes in and plops the resume down in front of you, and you see, hmm, in July of 2023, you were fired. It's like, yeah, 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 you know, I didn't get along with my boss. And then you continue to page through. And in May of 23, you were arrested. And in April of 23, you were cited for disorderly conduct. I, I mean, how many times are we going to allow this collection to try and fool us? And I'm telling you, and this is one of the teams, and I've talked about it before, that, dry, that drove me up the wall. This is not as talented a version of those last few wild teams that I refer to as the furious rallies because every time you're like where I am right now or where Phil is trending, right? Here's what they're going to do. They're going to come back and win a couple games and you're going to be like, Oh, okay. You know, and it's a winnable division. But all of that being said, I am not going to be fooled by a collection that for whatever reason is a dead ass team. And the other thing too is, you know, my faith in Baldelli and Falvey is absolutely gone. Derek Falvey, and I'm not going to cite that here because I think that's, I have no idea what that does now, but this is Derek Falvey's show. And Derek Falvey's ability to put together collections of, of players with no idea of how the chemistry will work is a remarkable thing. Um, he, he's a very smart guy, and he seems like a likable guy, so it's weird. But I don't think he can read people at all because he's done this before. It's a when when a team to Phil's point on Correa, and this is just a small thing, but it becomes a big thing. To Phil's point 
of asking, what's wrong with Correa? Which is a very good question, okay? I would ask, what's wrong with this entire clubhouse? Like, how are you letting each other down so consistently? This is this is a very, this is not as talented a version, but there is a parallel here, in my opinion, between the current Mets team, which again, is a dead-ass team, and this Twins team. Because when you're building rosters, and you can look at, and God bless them, advanced stats are great. I am not complaining about them. I don't have a problem with them. They are they definitely in every single sport can provide a very good basis for at least part of a decision. But this is about the second or third time that Falvey has put to put together a collection, a team that I would just say is flat out unlikable and does everything that they can to basically piss you off and then has the audacity to come back and say we're, we're not done yet though. Watch what we're going to, to do. Um I just, honest to God, I'm just done with this team. You know what's to, to your point about like the underachievement, the the, the question about Correa, and there's a, a list of guys, especially offensive players, Byron Buxton, some of its health. I guess it bothers me when we just chalk it all up to oh, it's like bad luck with health, right? I, I, to me, there's more to the story. One thing that really strikes me about the last couple of years, and it's totally different than like the 15, 20 years ago twins that were kind of like the little engine that could Ron Gardenhire twins. So in baseball, run differential over a six month period kind of tells you where you're supposed to be wins and losses. You know, like right now, the twins should actually be according to, uh, they call it the Pythagorean win loss scale based on how many runs you have outscored your opponents by after a hundred games or been outscored by, you should have this many wins based on baseball history, right? 2001, 2002, all the way through like 2006, even 2009 and 2010. So all those garden hire teams. Those teams regularly outperformed their expected win-loss totals. Where like their run differential would tell you, oh, you know, the history of baseball would say teams with a plus 40 run differential are this. And they would actually have the win-loss record of a team that was like a plus 80 or a plus 75. They would win 94 games when they were supposed to win 89. They would win 96 games when they were supposed to win 89 games, right? The last two years, led by Falvey down to Rocco Baldelli. These twins have underperformed their expected win-loss total by seven games, a handful of games this year, and then it was three or four games last year. This team should be like 57, 58 wins, but they constantly, like even whether it's Correa or the team the last couple of years, and I would even throw 2021 into this when they were pretty much exactly in line with their run differential, but they underachieved based on what their roster said. They, they were 16 games under 500 coming off back-to-back division championships, right? Why does this collective underachieve so greatly? Why are they not playing up to the 80th or 90th percentile of their abilities? And you can't just keep shrugging your shoulders and being like, well, bad luck, well, an injury. Like, every team deals with some bad luck and some injuries. Right. right. (laughs) What is in the fabric of the organization that has this team that's been – making win-now trades for three years. They've been desperately trying to, to, to add on to what they did in 2019 and 2020. They are trying to win and win big, and they are 21 games under 500 the last three seasons. Why? It's weird. Like, it's, it's so here- either incompetence or it's, it's, it's something in the fabric. I don't believe it's just bad luck and injuries. It's a combination of things, I think. So if... If we're going to parse that apart, and this is why it's not going to happen now. It's very clear in season, but this is why, and look, Falvey's to blame too, but I think if you're going to see a change made, Rocco's going to be blown out, and he deserves it, okay? Here's why. Rocco Baldelli and obviously the people above him have decided that pitchers were going to go deeper into games. Starting pitchers were going to go deeper into games this season, and that has happened, and that's a good thing. I think that's a good thing, and look, I think that... The majority of statistics that you will look at from the twin starters prove that that has worked out well. And yes, they have a good rotation. That's a great starting point. But you know what's never changed with Rocco? And this is going to sound abstract to a bit, but I'll, I'll explain it. Feel for the game and people, okay? On Saturday night, 
Willie Castro runs himself into one of the stupidest outs I've ever seen at third base. No. You are, again, the Royals are begging you, please don't be stupid. Just take this game from us. We had a big lead, but take this game. Willie Castro, I guess by himself, I don't think this had anything to do with coaching. I don't think Tommy Watkins played any role. No, decides to down. take, yeah. yeah, decides to take the extra base. And this goes back to Eddie Rosario territory. And I remember talking to Baldelli at the time, and I'm like, do you ever like bench guys? Do you ever do anything? Like, there has to be an, an, an accountability here. And he's like, that doesn't really work. I mean, and Willie Castro, there were, they sat him down after and talked to him. Zero repercussions. So if I see that, and again, he, he just played a role in costing you that game. Yep. If I see that you're never going to have anyone answer for anything other than a couple of clubhouse meltdowns, which are probably aimed at everyone. Athletes need to have some type of structure. Athletes need to have some type of accountability. You have to have... Here, here's my question, and I think Thad Levine is the answer, Phil. But in watching the operation, who would you say has any feel for human beings and what they need? So I don't mean just being nice, because I think Baldelli's a nice guy. But who would you say has the ability or has, in the last five years, actually held players accountable? Because if you don't, that sends a message that yeah. everyone can get away with whatever they want, and what Willie Castor did on Saturday was an unforgivably stupid mistake. I want to drill down on the word accountability here, because, and I'm going to stand up for Judd, because I see, and it's just a small like percentage of just people barking on the internet, but I see Judd on Twitter or... Uh, on my phone, it switched to the X app today. So it's weird. I think we're the, just gonna the, the little Twitter. icon, like it says X for me, but then there's times where like I close it and like the icon still like bugging out. And, like, is it Twitter? Or is it X? The Twitter or is it X? That happened yeah, a lot. Me too. Too. Yeah, in my <laughs> folder, it's Twitter, but then when I open the folder, it's X. So whatever it is, Judd gets clowned on by a certain section of Twins fans. For, for using the word accountability and asking where's the accountability. It's almost like there's a subsection of Twins fans. It's like a Stockholm Syndrome thing where despite the team drastically underachieving for now the third consecutive season and somebody with a microphone and a guy who's been watching Twins baseball for decades saying, why are they just allowed at every level to perform under the level that they're supposed to? Oftentimes with, with sort of like a tone of arrogance too, and not be held accountable. Where is there any sort of like semblance of expectations internally where you would say, hey, if we don't meet this, then we, we need to show that poor performance is not tolerated. And there is a chunk of Twins fans that mock that notion that hmm. accountability, you know, you know, whatever. And I don't know. I had um, a, a friend who's done like leadership consulting for different companies and stuff. And I'll never forget. He said something a few years ago in just a conversation. He said, we were talking about like leadership and, and he's talked about the word accountability. So when you, if you have a goal as a person or as an entity, you need to set the goal and then you need an action plan. Right. But then like at the end of this, you need accountability because if there isn't, if, Hey, we, we want to do this and here's our plan to do this. But then if we keep falling short of it and nothing changes or nothing happens and you just get into the cycle of poor performance, that your tolerance for poor performance is what starts the downward spiral. Like, if you aren't holding people accountable, if you're the poll ads and for three years the front office is underachieved, or if you're the front office and the man and the manager is underachieving or whatever it is, like, I don't know what it all looks like. I'm not demanding that everyone needs to get fired here, but this idea that you can just run it all back and try again next year with the same cast and the same leaders is insane to me. So... Culture is limited by your tolerance for poor performance, and the twins love to tolerate poor performance is, the, to me, the stamp from, like, this last weekend. And players want it. That's the thing is, if you play sports and you're good, you want to be held accountable. And, and look, I'm not saying that Baldelli has to sit everybody who screws up, but his quotes on Castro of, well, I found it doesn't really work. I have found so it's status quo is a ridiculous notion that I can tell you right now, star players want to see accountability. Guys that win want to see, and, and again, I don't mean benching everyone all the time, but I do mean 
Name me the last time that Rocco Baldelli sat somebody for screwing up. No. Name me the last time that this team did something that made sense from a perspective of the human element of how you win games. You know what? Does it even feel like it's Rocco Baldelli's team? No. Because I'll tell you what, from no. from 2001 well, through 2000, point. whatever, sometimes it was not going well. But like largely the Twins were really good from 2001 through 2010. That was Ron Gardenhire's team. Yep. And if you did something stupid, first of all, guys didn't do a lot of stupid things. But if you did something stupid, you no, were not right. in the lineup the next day. That's a great point. And he would get on. He would get on your ass, or he would get on. He'd get on a media member's ass to prove a point to like you know the, the clubhouse or whatever. It 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 always kind of feels like Rocco. I'm not saying that like if you let Rocco go now or in the off season that it fixes everything. And that's another thing that kind of irritates me about the Twins discussion that. What, you think it's Rocco's fault? No, we're looking for solutions here, okay? There's probably more than one solution. Yeah. But if a team is constantly underachieving and doing stupid things in the outfield, on the base path, you know, you have like the, the fly ball yesterday in left field. Cash it's clearly, clearly, cl- yep, clearly over your head, okay? It, like, and then and then Rocco, like, yeah, you know, he kind of kind of justifies it after the game is over. It's like, no, that's a boneheaded play, and that was a crucial run that wound up swinging the game, right? Yes. But well, whatever, we just people make mistakes and it happens. And like, I don't think you need to be a drill sergeant, but it just feels like we're plodding along for three years and we just keep, oh, we'll, char- we'll change the trainer out, but let's stick to the, it's a stick to the process thing that um, I have a hard time with. I think for me, the, the thing that just struggles is, all right, so they're in first place, barely, but they're in first place and they're in their really, really bad division. They have a path right now to, probably go to the playoffs, probably have a chance to break their playoff streak, and that's that's what's in front of you right now. You can blow out the manager in the front office, which, by the way, I'm, I'm not against at this point. I, I think it, they, they do need major changes, and I hope the Polad family kind of recognizes that. The problem is that they win a playoff game, you know, then it gives the optimism back. Oh, you know, we battled our tails off, we got back, and we ended a streak, and let's run this back, which upsets me. Um, but... I just I don't want to just forego looking ahead and and looking at future years and making those bigger changes when right now they still have a chance to win a playoff game and it's probably just more pent up frustration that I just want to see it happen that I'm okay, willing to kind of get out I got out of that noise. That's fine. Like that is still in mm-hmm. front of them, but this is like this is not a collection that you can then trade. I'm this, my my commentary is so much different than a week ago because they were up four games and they were headed to Kansas City. That's great, but then this collection here has to fix it themselves. Rocco, the 26 guys in the clubhouse and whoever you would call up, like, awesome. You guys can go win a playoff game. But Paul Goldschmidt's not coming to help this collection because you didn't do enough laying ground for it. the first four that, months. Yes, yes. and and But here's the – so if, if you broaden this entire discussion out to – here's my problem. And it, it's something that I think a, a lot of people who are probably – who think that the Twins – um, have some good ideas, we'll get, okay? The process here is completely flawed. That's that's the thing. The process is, if my, my question is this, to both Phil and Declan, do you guys think, playoff win or not, do you guys think that this franchise is on the right track? No. No. Most, no, no. There's your answer. Or, 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 That's not or, a yes. If I could frame it differently, like right track, wrong track, if I could say, do I feel like, the bones of this franchise from the strategy to the moves to the players to the young players everything do i feel really good about the next 5 years no right I do not because if i if if i was to use the old 76ers cliche trust the process what have they given you to trust what have they done and they've done a few things i'm not saying everything's bad but have they given you enough from Falvey on down, have they given you enough in in what I think is a fairly small amount of collaboration by people that they consider to be incredibly smart to say, yeah, you know what, they're losing or they're they might miss the playoffs or they might make it, but it's been disappointing. But do you trust the process? And my answer is absolutely not. And yeah. and look, I'm calling for Baldelli to be fired because I don't think the poll ads are going to fire Falvey. Do I think that there is a case to make a change at President of Baseball Operations? 
Absolutely there is. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think it's evident at this point that the twins aren't sitting on like a whiz kid that maybe they thought they were six years ago. I think that's well, fair to say. And whatever they want to do with that information is up to them. He needs, I, I honestly think he needs help. I, I think he needs somebody that understands actual chemistry of people. He basically has started to, if if you watch the teams, and this goes back to the Lance Lynn, Lomo, that year when they, they signed guys. Um he basically has started to build what he perceives to be good rotisserie league baseball teams without any thought for or knowledge of how it's going to actually gel and work. Yeah. And it's like, you know, even I, like, I can get Carlos Correa. Like, right, but, 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 a, but a good fan, but a good rotisserie baseball team wouldn't be 22nd in on base percentage. No, but know? I'm saying he likes like, to build the names. Like I can get Correa. That's awesome. I can get, but, but there's so much more to this. And I don't think anybody in authority, I think Levine might, but I think his role is so small now. I don't think anybody in authority actually understands construction of personality in the clubhouse. Couple other things here, real quick, before we get to, we have an immaculate grid to get to. I'm going to speed through one category here. It's uh, pitching regression, which we've already kind of touched on. But just to sure. highlight some of this, God, the pitching was so lights out for the first three or four months, and we knew that it was going to regress to some extent. So, like to not be nine games up while you had the best pitching staff in baseball is the most frustrating thing. So, Sonny Gray's last eight starts, his ERA is a tick under five. He's given up a 28% line drive rate, which is what that means of the batted balls. Basically, a third of them are line drives the last eight starts. Wow. That's really not good. His <laughs> walk rate is double what it was in the previous, like, whatever, 14 starts. Joe Ryan, since the complete game shutout, six starts, a 7.62 earned run average, and 13 bombs allowed in 28 innings. Yeah, including a bunch in the first, right? It feels you like give he's... You give up five home runs in that first start after, right? Yeah. Um, yes. Oh, and you're saying in the first inning? Yeah, I'm saying, like, against the White Sox, he gave up. Yeah. It, it feels like he is he is trying to establish the fastball, and teams know he's going to do that and are sitting on the fastball to start yeah. games. And then Duran, and this might just be a little bit of a, you know, small sample size blip, but since July 2nd, a 7.27 ERA with a 28% line drive rate allowed. Yeah. So these guys are allowed to have some bad stretches. It's all kind of happening in the same month, <laughs> and it's happening at a time where you should be burying teams like the Royals. And fans are pissed, which is my final category for you guys. I just want to read some comments from, you know, we are a show of the people here on the Score North Twin Show. You can always hit us up, the feedback tab on the Score North app or the YouTube comment section on the Score North YouTube channel. Matt Collins said, I visited Kauffman Stadium for the away Twins game on Saturday. Here are my takeaways. Bobby Witt Jr. makes Carlos Correa look like a minor leaguer. And it's pretty embarrassing to be a Twins fan watching a pitcher with a 1-12 record who one-hit the Twins through four innings. Yeah. Robbie B says, as predicted by so many, the Twins pitching seems to be coming back to earth. They wasted excellent first half pitching. They should have a 15-game lead in this garbage division with the pitching they got in the first half. And then uh, Chuck Jerzak comes in with a little more vitriol. He says, after this weekend's debacle, it's time for firings in all capital letters. <laughs> Starting with Croco, then Falvey. Afterwards, take a page from the Oakland A's fans and start chanting, sell the team. People are bad at um, ads again. I did see this. Every to every cowardly poll ad with any link to this pathetic ball team, sell the team. So, all right, that's the sense I get too. Kind of perusing through like social media and when people are people are not happy right now with the twins. Yeah, they they are they are absolutely correct because again, it's not just a team that is consistently up and down and dead but it's a team that you can see it. Like, you can just see the problems. Yeah. Does it also it, feel like, like, I'll throw it back to Declan, because you're trying to make, you're trying to, like, stay the course here and be optimistic, and I appreciate that. Does this team strike you as a team that's going to band together with a rallying cry of some kind and go on a run? Like, the 09 Twins, you know, went on right. that crazy run at the end of the season. The 06 twins were like eight games under 500 and they banded together. And there was a lot of that, like in the garden hire era. Does this team give you hope that they'll band together 
all right, screw all the outside stuff, screw the bad start, let's start performing up to our peak capability. You know, I, I genuinely really like the players in the clubhouse. I, I like Carlos Correa. I know he's um, he's struggling this year, but he's been to World Series. He's been in big moments. He's delivered. I love that. That's kind of your le leader. I like that they have young players that are starting to come up a little bit. I know Kirloff just went on the IL, unfortunately. But I love that they kind of have this next batch that's finally showing something of, as someone who always says trade prospects and is never your prospects are never going to hit their 100 ceiling, you're seeing guys like Kirloff and Royce Lewis of, no, this is why you hold on to your prospects, this is why you develop them, this is why you're patient with them, because they can actually be legitimate uh, stars for you going forward. So I like the clubhouse a lot. Um, I just, yeah, in terms of Rocco and Falvey, I still have major, major questions there. To answer your question, yes, I think the players in the clubhouse can. I think they can band it together. And we've seen it from random other Twins teams. 2017, when they had Jaime Garcia here for a start, sold their closer, and then all of a sudden Brian Dozier was, of all people, got the team pissed off enough where they actually go to a wild card game, right? So, like, I can see this collection getting upset enough and getting enough fire in their belly to turn things around. Yes, I can, I can see that by the end of the year. Don't sell Paul short, though. M Molly had a lot to do with, with that. And he got blown out in part because mm -hmm. he didn't become the essential robot that Derek wanted. So, like, yeah, I, I guess my question would, would be this. In that clubhouse, who's going to be the guy? Who's going to be the guy that says, this ends here, this well, ends right now? It needs right to now. be Correa. Like, no, right? I know it does, it's but I don't think it's going to be. But I don't think it's going to be, man. This has been, I mean, he has been for for. What he's paid at the plate, he's been dreadful. He has been dreadful, and something's off. And again, I don't know if it's physical, if it's mental, whatever it is. I think it's very hard when when you are as you know, basically across the board, establishing career low in offensive stats. I think it's very hard to say I'm in charge here now, and it's not gonna be Buxton. Yeah. By the way, that 17 team, the 2017 team, after they were told, "Hey, we're selling." At the trade deadline, because because and that they brought it on themselves, because that team was when they acquired Garcia, they were like a game back in the division, and then they lost their ass for the next week. They got swept in Los Angeles, they lost uh, two or three to Detroit, then they lost back to back in Oakland. Um, they wind up a week later, seven games back in the division on trade deadline day and the front office and three games under 500, which is like, if you're the front office, you're going to be like, what That's am it. I supposed to do with this? Like right. we, we, and I think we praised him at the time they had to sell, but then the, the clubhouse got pissed, right? Brian Dozier voiced his opinion to the star tribune. I remember all this stuff. They got pissed. It's like, well, you guys, you kind of determine your own fate. And then that team went on in the next month. So the rest of August, they went 20 and nine the rest of yep. August to yep. put themselves back. Now, they didn't obviously, they, they didn't win the division that year, uh, but they did put themselves in a wild card spot. So can th does this team have a 20 and nine August in them to get to where that, two, and if they do that, by the way, they win the division. They don't have to, you know, do the one game wild card thing that doesn't even exist anymore. But, um, mm -hmm. That's what that's that's what we need to see in August, I guess, for Declan's sort of narrative to to come to fruition. But maybe maybe we'll piss him off if tomorrow if the message to that clubhouse is, hey, screw you guys, <laughs> don't get swept by Kansas City, and next time we might trade for Paul Goldschmidt, but not now. Right. So go figure it out on your own. You know, I'd be fine with that. Okay. I like that. <sighs> Therapeutic. Let's... Feel good. Yeah, kind of. Kind of. Feel good. Kind Voice of. these things I, off your chest. I don't want this show to just be that the rest of the year. I though, agree. So I agree. Well, but I mean, it's but, up but to them. But it, but it needs not to us. be today. Like, it, like there's yes. no other way to talk about them today other than like, what are you well, doing? Why are and you especially doing? with Apologist Central out there. I mean, we we got you know. That's the problem. Is you get way Pick too much. Pick a fight. Come you on. got way too much BS noise out there trying to find. The good. And it's like, do you do you think anyone at One Twins Way is like, yeah, you know what? But there's some positives. I hope to hell there's not. I hope what they're, they should be 10 times more pissed off than we are. Yeah. Well, we'll see what uh, the trade deadline brings here. And if they do something big, we'll definitely jump in. We'll probably do an emergency score on a twin show. We have an immaculate grid coming up to put a fun spin on the rest of this episode. 
presented by our friends at Power Lodge and Miller Marine. You know, maybe maybe today's the day. Take a take a half day off work, go into Power Lodge or Miller Marine, and get yourself a pontoon for some throttle therapy. I can't think of a better time as a Twins fan to need some throttle therapy than right now, Judd. Exactly. You know what? Get away from baseball completely. It, it's going to heat up again, uh, I think, on Wednesday and Thursday. No better time to be on the lake in your Bennington. Just soaking it all in. Relaxation, slower heart rate. Everything will be better if you are on the lake on a Bennington. So, yes, throttle therapy, very necessary, too, before football season starts. So take this time to take a deep breath and enjoy. Yeah, just head to MillerMarine.com or PowerLodge.com and uh, snag some throttle therapy for yourself. Financing available on approved credit, freight, and prep are not included in packages. Check them out. Also, a shout-out to our friends at Finch Home Solutions for uh, helping idiots like us with things around the house. Yes, you know what? I can DIY a deck, but when it comes to electrical issues at my home, I can't. But that's why Cody Finch and his team at Finch Home Solutions exist to make your life as easy as possible. I'm talking about projects big. I'm talking about rewiring your entire house. Yes, or... Something as small as installing an outlet, which they did for me a few months ago. They're courteous. They're professional. They're quick. I can't tell you how easy Finch makes the process. And when people are coming into your home to do work, you want it to be fast, efficient, and easy, professional. And that's what Finch is going to give you. You can call them, 612-357-2604, or go online and schedule an appointment, finchhomesolutions.com, finchhomesolutions.com. And, of course, tell them that the guys from Score North told you that you listen to sports dad you're not DIYing and uh, 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 you're letting Finch take care of it in this case all right it's time for the immaculate grid challenge here on the score North twin mm. show <laughs> so I'm gonna over explain this because there are still some people that are like what the hell is this game I don't understand like Roycey like Roycey ah, what are we doing? all right so for the audio audience follow along here mentally for the YouTube audience on the Scorn of the YouTube channel, the Immaculate Grid gives you nine boxes in a tic-tac-toe sort of layout. And uh, and they've got the boxes labeled this way. So the, we're going to put five minutes on the clock, and we're looking to fill these boxes with any player in Major League history that was both a Philly and a Guardian slash Indian at some point in their careers, a Philly who was also a Cub, so... If they played one season for the Cubs, one season for the Phillies, boom. Correct answer. And then a Philly who was an MVP. Also looking for an A who was a Guardian or an Indian, an A who was a Cub, and an A who was an MVP. And then a Guardian or an Indian with 3,000 career hits. It's just a a player who had 3,000 hits who also at some point played for the Guardian. They ought to have all 3,000 with the Guardians. Right. Same for a Cub with 3,000 career hits, and then an MVP who also had 3,000 career hits. Five minutes this. on the clock. We got to go nine for nine for it to be an immaculate grid. Three, two, one. Here we go. Cleveland, Philadelphia, Manny Trio, second baseman in the late 70s into the 80s. Manny Trio. You're Is that confident the one? that? Yep. Okay. 0.6. Judd, you bastard. Let's go. A's and Indians or Guardians? How about Coco Crisp? Oh, that's a good, good one. one. I was going to say Rajay Davis. That's um, a good one, too. Oh, that's a... That, that might be that might be better, Dex. What's the more... Do we know. want the obscure score. I feel like Rajay is more... Well, but we're confident in both current. of them. And They're I think... They're both going to so, be under 10%, right? Yeah. So I the, feel like Coco. Okay. Coco. Because Rajay had those big hits with Cleveland in the World Series. Yeah. Um, so Let's Coco. See. 19. Okay. I'm sorry. That's yeah, okay. that's, that's I, good. I, I think Rajay would have been around the same. Okay. Uh, how about a guardian? So a guardian with 3,000 career hits. Um, I mean, Eddie Murray, didn't he play for the Indians he, toward the end of his career? In fact, he got 3,000 at the Metrodome as an Indian. Should we go Eddie Murray? Sure. 77 and 97. Only one. Oh, God, a great player. 48%. God damn it. Okay. Well, we're not going to set the record for uh, for lowest. Yeah, but we don't want to get cute. That's okay. That's yeah, okay. I'm fine with this. Uh, Let's not with- knock out some MVPs here. Sure. That. Jimmy Rollins is one who I thought of for the Phillies. Jimmy yeah, Rollins won the MVP? One. Mm-hmm. In 07. Okay. Really? Wow. Mm-hmm. Dex is sure of it, so I have no problem with that. Okay. Nice. 17%. Dude, big time. Good job. Big time. MVP from the Mike, A's. Mike Schmidt would have been another one there, right? 
Yep. Yeah. Uh, for the for the Chavez or Tejada. Did they win it? I'm so oh. bad with MVPs, dude. I, yeah, see, Giambi, I, I prefer the teams. Like, I'm way more of a fan oh. of the teams than, than the, like, I don't know, man. I don't gold know gloves and one. BS like that. Tejada did, though, right? I don't know. Did I, he? If you go way back, Reggie Jackson probably won an MVP, right, Judd? Did, did he win an MVP? Nah, I don't know he won one as an A, though. Really? I feel like Who, Jackson? I yeah. Feel like he did. As, as an A? I what mean, about, you, uh, did, didn't Ken Seiko win the MVP one year? That's what I'm wondering. Anderson? Did Ricky That's Henderson what, win? Oh, oh, Ricky. Ooh, Ricky might, yeah. Dude, Did we Ricky? just named every relevant A's player in it history is, there. We're I think sure. all of those guys. Well, no, they... <laughs> Vita Blue? The, Did those Vita teams Blue that won... I think he might have. So the, those teams that won three consecutive World Series in the early 70s. Jackson was on that team. Vita Blue. Let's did Vita Blue win? Did Vita come Blue back. win a Cy Young and MVP? And an MVP in the same year. Oh, let's come back. Let's come okay. back to it. Okay. 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 We have an MVP who had three thousand career hits. I mean, I mean, Willie. May did they have MVPs back in Willie Mays era? Yeah. Willie Mays really? for sure. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a ton of choices here. You know, Willie Mays. Let's do Willie Mays. Clock. Okay. Six percent. Nice. nice. Very right, nice. Let's Very knock nice. out some Cubs here. So Jake Arrieta pitched for the Phillies and the Cubs, right? That's pretty recent, though. Mitch Williams? Some... Oh, Mitch Williams. Yeah, dude. That's a good one. Wild thing? That's a really good one. 1%. Nice. A, a Cut. was a cub. Addison Russell, right? Addison, Addison Russell, Russell, the shortstop, right? Because he got traded right from the A's, big time prospect. Does that. Well, wait, wait, wait. Oh, if he didn't play, if he was in the A system, oh, he has to no, play a game. Yep, he has count. to. Okay, play okay. One let's be care let, let, let's be careful then. One okay, plate appearance. Here. Yeah. I'm trying to think yeah. back in the day here. He probably did Dex, but I don't want to take the chance. Oh, uh, not Ted Lilly. Uh, Ted, yeah. hey, Ted, Ted, Ted Lilly. Did Ted Lilly play for the A's? Pretty sure. Play for the Yankees played for, for the sure. Cubs and the Jays. Oh, hold on, wait, wait. Cubs and A's. Why am I? I I'm usually lights out Ted, aces what, on this. Uh, Ted Lilly. Was there Obscure, like, outfielder or something else. Did Corey Patterson play for the A's? Played for Baltimore. I remember Did Jack Baltimore. Cust play for the Cubs? Oh, God, that's good. <laughs> I I mean, I have no idea, but I love Jack Cust. That's a great name. Um, what about a Cub with 3,000 career hits? Did Ernie Banks get 3,000 career hits? Uh, 500 home runs. He had 500 homers. I don't think he had 3,000 hits. Though, he, he might not have had 3,000 hits. I don't know that for sure. Mark Grace did not get the 3,000 career hits. Okay, so who passed? Sam who had three thousand hits? Here. Phil that passed through Chicago. Us, uh, not Sandberg. Um, not like Sandro. was there a short time Cub? I, dude, Ernie. I think Ernie Banks might have gotten three thousand. Oh, you might man. have. I'm just not sure of it. I think we got to go. We got thirty okay, seconds. Okay, up. okay, Try okay. Ernie go. Banks. Ernie Banks. Eh. Just, damn it. Wrong. God dang it. We have twenty seconds left, so we have to start guessing. Uh, should we go Chavez. Like, or should we go with that? Dude, I I would go I'd go, go to Hada. Hada before Chavez, but oh god, yeah, 15%. yeah, okay, nice. Uh, hey, yeah, go uh, the the pitcher, Ted Lilly. Yep, go Ted Lilly. I'm pretty sure you're right about this. Yeah, yeah nice 1%. job, guys. All right, and we just beat the buzzer by two percent. Uh, okay, so seconds. what Cubs? That's we're gonna be pissed at ourselves for what? Which ones? Uh, Cub who had three thousand hits. Three thousand hits. There's only three of them. Did Billy Williams? So here's the thing. Sometimes when you hit the thing on it, it doesn't come up. It, like it just gives you all of them. Oh, Sometimes the links are broken. Oh yeah. It just says three. Um. So, yeah, I'm not dude, sure. I. <laughs> I'm trying to think, man. I mean, I, and I'm I'm like a Cubs fan, yeah, as a kid and everything, and I, and I was trying to think Sosa of a guy who like have 3, passed through, like who, who got traded at the deadline at some point to Chicago, something like that. It doesn't show me. Sometimes you need also the 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 stat the stat had a paid price to see some of this stuff. Too. Addison Russell, hold on, I'm gonna find out if he actually played a, a game as an agent. Billy Williams had 2,700 hits. So hold on, I'll find it. Cubs with 3,000 hits. Uh, Lou Brock. See, that's a yeah, exactly. He Lou passed Brock. through. He passed through, right? Yeah. Well, he no, he he started his career there and then was traded to the Cardinals early, One of the, though, right? Yes, very uh, early. Coco Chris was the most common guardian. Um, a oh, answer. really? Doggone yeah. it. <laughs> Should have gone with uh, Rujai. There's a bunch of other ones, too. We probably could have. Uh, I'm just looking right. through, like, Cubs franchise just for fun here since we're wasting time doing this. Top 10 career batting hits. Okay. Oh, Cap Anson. <laughs> yeah. See, yeah. 
So Cap Anson, Ernie Banks had 2,500. Yeah, that's real. That's brutal. Lou Brock, Cap Anson, and some other guy that we aren't thinking of. What's his name? Oh, dude, Cap, Russell did Cap did not Anson. play a game. Cap Anson's last call, year in the one. major leagues was nine was 1897 as a 45 year old. Yeah, but he's really good. I remember that season. Hey, come on, throw the ball around the yard now. Cap, Cap Anson, Anson. The ball. no, they're right, Cap Anson. Hey, right. Everyone's out to hey. see Cap Anson. Yeah, at the ball yard. Cap Anson from Marshalltown, Iowa, here to inspire. Oh, the ball. you know who we missed? Ralphio Palmero. Four. Oh, Cub with three thousand hits. With oh. Started his that's career a, as a, a Cub. Brutal question. Brutal question. Ral Ralphie. Thirty-five percent had it, from what it said. When so one of the answers. One. Has a guy who was born five years after the Civil War ended. I feel I like never we just did tip our steroids. Cap. I never Period. did steroids. Period. 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 Except when I did, but don't ask me about that. All right. Oh my God. All right. Well, thanks for hanging out with us here on this somewhat therapeutic episode of the Scorn Earth Twin <sighs> Show, where we just want the Twins to win a playoff game at some point uh, after almost twenty years. We'll see you guys.